Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. Good. It's Wednesday. Did Dr. Fox tell you guys his dad joke? <gasps> then I'm going to steal it from him. All right. So why doesn't a photon carry a suitcase? Yeah, why doesn't a photon carry a suitcase? Because it's traveling light. <laughs> so yeah, so when, when, when Fox gives you that joke, say, because it's traveling light, and he'll go, oh, I told you. So good, good, good. All right, so here's what we're going to cover today. We're going to cover... We stopped last time with the inguinal canal. We're going to cover inguinal canal today. We're going to cover lumbar plexus today. And then we're going to cover the blood supply and the posterior abdominal wall. After this, we're going to shoot right into the viscera on Monday. And we'll cover the blood supply to the viscera, nervous supply to the viscera, and a little bit of function to the viscera. Within the context of this course, we're not going to cover a ton of visceral function because Dr. Justice has already done a phenomenal job in physiology covering a lot of that stuff. Okay, so we're basically going to cover where everything is and how the blood supply connects and how the nervous supply connects. That's basically going to be about it. After that, we're jumping right into the pelvis. Okay, so from here until probably the first week of March, we're actually going to go pretty quick. Okay, so what I'm going to ask is just keep up with your readings, keep up with the homework. Um, but I don't spend a ton of time in the viscera because I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for things like the hip, knee, ankle, stuff that we're typically going to see more in physical therapy. Okay. All right. So if remember from last time, we talked about the contents of the inguinal canal. Yeah. Oh, that too. I knew I forgot something. Wait a minute. There we go. Let's give that a second to pop up there. All right, so contents of the inguinal canal, and I'll wait for this to pop up here in a second. We're basically going to have three different things. Bless you. Bless you. That was an aggressive sneeze. That was very aggressive, wasn't it? So the first big thing we're going to see that travels through the inguinal canal is going to be the spermatic cord in the male anatomy or the round ligament to the uterus. in the female anatomy. The second big thing we're going to see travel in this canal is going to be the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. Now, the genital femoral nerve is another one of these great structures, and I know you guys are sick of me saying it. It says what it is, and it is what it says, right? So the genital femoral nerve is going to supply some innervation to my genital region. So for my males, it's going to go to the scrotum. For females, it's going to go to the mons pubis, and we'll cover those a little later when we cover the pelvic anatomy. Femoral nerve, the femoral branch, I should say, of the genital femoral nerve is going to go basically to kind of the inside anterior thigh or the femoral region. The third thing that's going to go through this lovely little canal is going to be the ilioinguinal nerve. This is another nerve that literally kind of says what it is and is what it says, All right? So my ilium or my iliac region is going to be the area right around the pelvis 
that's associated with the ilium. My, my pelvis is going to be made up of three different bones, and we'll get to that a little later, right? So ilium, ischium, and pubis are the three bones that make up my pelvis. The ilial region or iliac region is going to be where we see ilioinguinal nerve kind of go through. The inguinal part literally tells you where it's going to go, right? So on a test question or whatever, hey, what passes through the inguinal canal? That should be a pretty easy one. Italy inguinal nerve is going to, plus these others. Okay, any questions on that, on the contents? Okay, I'm going to give another few seconds here for folks to write that down, and then we're going to draw it out. Okay, everybody good? Anybody not good? Okay. All right, so in terms of the inguinal canal, what we have to kind of remember is that the inguinal canal itself is an open passageway, okay? And that's really important to remember because we're going to have a whole bunch of muscles that look like they're kind of coming together, but they're really not. Because what's happening is that we're going to have external abdominal oblique that kind of comes through the anterior portion is going to form the anterior wall internal abdominal oblique and transverse abdominus kind of form the superior and the posterior wall but then i have the kind of this open negative space in the middle and that's where that canal is going to come in so what we're going to have here i'm going to draw out an oldie but a goodie this is going to represent my asis anterior superior iliac spine I'm going to make a little legend here of all of the abbreviations. So PC is going to be my pubic crest. OF is going to be my obturator foramen. Yes. This is going to be my pubic synthesis. And those are going to be like the big landmarks for this inguinal canal. The other landmark that we're going to draw in here is going to be this tiny little bump right on top of the pubic crest. And that's going to be called the pubic tubercle. So, big thing to remember here, I'm not going to draw in external abdominal oblique. I kind of mentioned that at the very end of Monday's class because it's going to cover the entire front of everything. If I draw in external abdominal oblique, we won't be able to see anything else. So, what I am going to draw in is going to be the inguinal ligament. Okay, so the inguinal ligament. Mm, I want to reach all that. The inguinal ligament is going to go basically from the ASIS 
out to the pubic tubercle. Okay, so this guy here is going to be the inguinal ligament. That is going to be the free edge of EAO. The inguinal ligament is going to attach ASIS to the pubic tubercle. And then it's also going to have this tiny little reflection that kind of goes on to the pubic crest. And that tiny little reflection is going to be called the lacunar ligament. So if you guys have seen that in your reading, that's exactly what the lacunar ligament is. So basically all it is, inguinal ligament comes down, attaches onto the pubic tubercle, shoots off a few extra fibers onto the pubic crest, and those few extra fibers that shoot off on the pubic crest is what we call the lacunar ligament. Okay, so that's all the lacunar ligament really is. Okay, how are we doing so far? Doing okay? All right. So the inguinal canal is gonna have two different openings, okay? It's gonna have a beginning opening and it's gonna have an ending opening. The ending opening is going to be a little more superficial, and it's going to be what we call supralateral. So it's going to kind of come right about here. And this guy is going to be called the superficial inguinal ring. So SIR is going to be superficial inguinal ring. And you guys probably already kind of figured it out. If we have a superficial inguinal ring, what else are we going to have? Probably a deep inguinal ring, right? Now, the deep inguinal ring is going to occur right about halfway in between. So this is going to be my DIR. And this is going to be halfway, we'll call it down, the inguinal ligament. Okay, so DIR is my deep is my deep inguinal ring. So essentially what we have here, if we connect DIR and SIR, right? So my superficial inguinal ring and my deep inguinal ring. You can kind of see the makings of a little canal. So my ilioinguinal nerve, the genital branch of general femoral nerve, spermatic cord or round ligament of the uterus are literally going to pass right through that inguinal canal and literally it's not very big it's about the diameter of a straw to be quite honest with you and i'm not talking like one of those big funky panera straws they give you for the cold drinks and being like a regular mcdonald's straw so it's not very big okay it's just a little bit of a defect if you will everybody doing okay Okay, so the other big parts of this canal are going to be basically kind of what backs it, for lack of a better term, or reinforces it. First big reinforcing structure we're going to have, we kind of discussed in the past, and what we're going to have is we're going to have fibers 
running superior and medial. And should probably already be cued in on what muscle this is going to be. This guy's going to be my IAO. Okay. Now, what we see as we start approaching the inguinal canal is that these fibers from IAO actually start to curve down. And I'm going to draw this in dotted to represent the fact that they're going deep to or behind the inguinal canal. So you remember kind of talking about a week ago, I said those fibers kind of come up and around and attach in. And in fact, we're going to have all sorts of these that kind of come around and attach in. And it kind of comes all the way down here, the pubic tubercle. Just kind of imagine all that. Okay, there's a lot of reinforcement here. The other big muscle that we have that's going to be a reinforcer here is going to be another muscle that we already encountered. And this muscle is going to be deep. And this fiber is going to run straight transverse. So you probably already figured it out. This is going to be my transverse abdominus. Same thing's going to happen here. Okay. So these fibers, as they start approaching the inguinal canal, are going to start diving downward. And in fact, they're going to join up with internal abdominal oblique on their way to attach into the pubic tubercle. And you probably read when you're looking at like the muscle chart and the attachments and stuff, did you notice it said, internal abdominal oblique and transverse abdominus attach to the pubic tubercle via the conjoint tendon. What that conjoint tendon is, is literally where these guys come together. So there's a blending that happens between IAO and TA as they dive into and attach to the pubic tubercle. Where these guys come together, that is the conjoint tendon. So this is another structure that if you kind of know the language of anatomy, it makes a lot of sense. Okay, so think about testing questions. Okay, so why is the conjoint tendon called the conjoint tendon? What does con mean? Right. So joint means together, con means two, right? So I should know based on the name that I have two structures that come together to form that tendon. If there were three, it would be called the tri-joint tendon, right? If there were four, it would be called the quad-joint tendon. But I have two, so it is the con-joint tendon. Okay, so this is basically how the inguinal canal is made up. Remember, I have EAO that offers the anterior support, plus the EAO free edge becomes the inguinal ligament. IAO and TA sweep across the top and the back, come together via the conjoint tendon to attach in the pubic tubercle. And they offer superior and posterior support. I'll keep that up for another couple of minutes so folks can draw it out. And then we're going to move on to the lumbar plexus. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's the where the arcuate line starts. Good question. Yeah. So where you see that curving. So I'll kind of draw that in. I'll dot that in. So that's going to be my arcuate line. Yep, good point. Yeah, I'm just happy all the tech is working today. This is kind of nice. Shouldn't say anything. 
Oh, I know, I know. Shh, shh, shh. What deep part? The deep part of the canal. The deep, um, the deep, ingu deep ingu ring or? Yeah. Okay. I don't know where does it sit. Just so if my inguinal ligament goes from my ASIS, which is for me here, down to my pubic tubercle, which is right next to my pubic symphysis, okay? So that's basically my inguinal ligament. It's going to be right in the middle. Okay, so what we're going to see is that my inguinal, my ileal hypogastric, my ileal inguinal nerves, those are all going to come from my lumbar plexus. So they're all going to wrap around and then dive down into the canal if I'm the ileal inguinal nerve or the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. But they're going to originate from my low back and then they're going to wrap around and dive into my inguinal canal. Make sense? Okay, that answer your question. Okay. Any other questions on this? Good. Everyone good with the picture? So anyone not good with the picture? Need more time. Okay. All right, lumbar plexus. Remember, we only have two plexi to learn this semester, and they're nowhere nearly as difficult as the brachial plexus or the cervical plexus. Yay. So with my lumbar plexus, there's going to be a little bit of a misnomer at the very, very beginning. Okay. So my lumbar plexus is technically going to start up at T12. I know. It's called lumbar, but there's a little branch that comes off the T12. Now, my T12 is going to be called my subcostal nerve. And we already talked about intercostal nerves, right? We kind of talked about the intercostal nerve, artery, vein. The subcostal nerve runs the same course as those other intercostal nerves right so it's going to wrap around from back to front the reason it's called the subcostal nerve is simply because sub meets under there's no other rib underneath of it so we can't call it intercostal because inter means between okay so that's all that's all the subcostal nerve is so t12 is going to throw a branch and it's going to help out my lumbar plexus the other pieces and parts I'm going to have are L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. Obviously corresponding to the different lumbar nerves and lumbar vertebral levels. So what I'm going to see is I'm actually going to see my subcostal it's actually going to innervate a couple muscles we've already talked about. One we did, did not talk about, the other one we actually talked about. The one that we talked about is going to be transverse abdominis. The other one that we didn't really talk about that much and it is a tiny, super duper tiny muscle. I don't know if have you guys uncovered it yet. Pyramidalis. Got on one body. Got on one body. Okay. <clears throat> Fantastic. <clears throat> so there's this tiny, super duper tiny muscle that kind of comes off the pubic symphysis and attaches into the linea alba. And it's called the pyramidalis muscle. And it literally 
this muscle is named based on what it looks like. It looks like a little pyramid. So if you look at the cadavers, you're going to see these little muscle fibers that kind of go in a supramedial fashion. They kind of go up and in, but they're literally down here at the pubic symphysis. And it looks like they attach into linea alba. What the pyramidalis muscle does is it tenses the linea alba. Okay, so if we think about it, okay, I have rectus abdominis, which is doing its thing, it's contracting, giving, you know, people not like me a six pack. I have external abdominal oblique and internal abdominal oblique. And they're contracting right on both sides and they're pulling and doing all this stuff. The linea alba is not a bone, right? Linea alba is a piece of tissue and a soft piece of tissue with that. So what the pyramidalis muscle does is literally it just kind of pulls that linea alba taut, for lack of a better term, to provide a better anchor point for all those other muscles to contract. So that's all it does. If you look at Gray's, it says it tenses the linea alba. That's why it tenses the linea alba, because it's going to pull down that linea alba and provide a nice anchor point for all those muscles to basically contract. Okay, so that's all it does. So moving on, what I'm going to see here is that my L1, its main nerve is going to be the ilioinguinal nerve. We already kind of talked about that guy as it goes through the inguinal canal. What I'm also going to see is I'm also going to see my T12 and L1, and this is where the subcostal nerve comes in. It shoots a little branch that joins up with a little branch of L1, and it makes a nerve called the iliohypogastric. This is another muscle, I'm sorry, another nerve that kind of says what it is, is what it says. So ilio, meaning ilium, hypo, meaning less than, right? Because if my patient has hypotension, their blood pressure is less than what it should be. Gastric, meaning stomach. So this nerve wraps around the ilium underneath the stomach. That's literally all it means. So that's going to be the combination of T12 and L1. It basically wraps around the ilium below the stomach. That's literally all it means. What I, oh, the other thing I'm going to see here is I'm going to see that L1 and L2 are going to come together. And when L1 and L2 come together, and we already kind of talked about this one a little bit. This is going to be my genitofemoral nerve. The next thing I'm going to see is that L3 and L2 are going to come together. So L3 is going to throw this little branch that helps out L2. And this is going to be a nerve called the lateral cutaneous femoral nerve. It goes by two different names. It's either lateral cutaneous femoral nerve or lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. 
So you'll see it both ways in the literature. I think Gray's uses lateral cutaneous femoral nerve. But that's basically L2, L3 combined. The other nerves I'm going to see that come off here, so what I'm going to do here is we're going to draw in L4, L5. I'm going to see L2, L3, and L4. They're going to form up two monster nerves that we're going to talk about literally for almost the rest of the semester. So L2, L3, L4 come together. And form the obturator nerve. The obturator nerve, as we're going to see, the lower extremity is going to have a very similar nerve and artery distribution pattern that the upper extremity did. So if you guys kind of remember, we talked about if I know what region I'm in in the arm, the forearm, I can kind of figure out what nerve is innervating everything and what artery is providing blood. The obturator nerve is going to hit my medial thigh. OK, so you guys probably already talked about like intestine measures, testing the adductors. What we're going to see is the obturator nerve is going to hit the vast majority of those adductors. Right, so adductor magnus, adductor brevis, gracilis, muscles like that. OK. The other thing that's going to happen here between L2, 3 and 4 is I'm going to have another nerve that we're going to spend a lot of time with. And it's going to pick up branches, like I said, from L2, L3 and L4. And this is going to be my femoral nerve. Now my femoral nerve is going to provide a ton of motor. It's going to provide some sensation as well. We're going to get into that when we cover the hip and the thigh. But I just need to know where my femoral nerve is coming from. It's coming from L2, L3, and L4. Okay. The other piece of the lumbar plexus is actually kind of slick because the other plexus that we're going to learn is going to be the sacral plexus and the very beginnings of the sacral plexus are going to come from l4 and l5 and that's called the lumbo sacral trunk That's basically how my lumbar plexus is made up. So as you can see, not nearly as bad as brachial plexus and not nearly as bad as a cervical plexus, right? When everyone's done drawing this, I'm gonna give you a little mnemonic device to help remember this. And then what we're going to do is we're going to draw in how these nerves relate to, and this will help you with cadaver lab as well, and identification of these nerves, how they all are situated in the lumbar spine and around the pelvis. Okay, because what we're going to see is we're going to have some, ner some nerves come out and they're going to wrap around the lateral side of the psoas major. We're going to have one that actually pierces psoas major. And if you kind of know those things, it'll make the lab a lot easier. Everybody good? Anybody not good? OK. All right, so here's let me erase this real fast and I'll give you my little mnemonic.
All right, so here's my little mnemonic, and this is how I would suggest in terms of mnemonic devices remembering it. You don't have to. You can use whatever you want, honestly. I twice... Got lunch on Friday. So I twice means we have an I and an I, All right? Get it? I twice. Ilio hypogastric. Ilioinguinal. The got genitive femoral. The lunch. Lateral femoral cutaneous. On. Obturator. Friday. Femoral. So. Like I said, I'm not a huge mnemonic person, but this one actually does help, at least in my opinion. So I twice got lunch on Friday. Really super duper easy way to remember it. All right, any questions? Everybody good? Give everyone another couple minutes to write that one down. Yes. It is not terribly important. Um, it is you. I'll be quite honest with you. You're not going to find it on every cadaver. It is super duper small. Um, it provides a little bit of cutaneous stimulation, but that's about it. Pyramidalis. Okay. That is those. Those are the muscles the nerve goes to. Yep. So the T12. The name of the nerve is subcostal. Okay. So T12 is subcostal. Goes to pyramidalis and transverse abdominis. That that cleared up. Yeah. All right. Sweet. Any other questions? All right, so here's what we're going to do. So I'm going to draw in. Everybody good? Okay. So basically what I'm going to draw is I'm going to draw in a psoas major muscle. And we're just going to kind of draw in where these nerves are in relation to psoas major. Now understand that this is going to happen on the right side and the left side. So we're gonna have two sets of these. Okay. So there's my psoas major. And what we're going to see is the psoas major is going to be a huge landmark for a lot of these nerves. Okay. Basically, a lot of these nerves are going, you're going to be able to identify them based on their relation or their reference point to psoas major. Okay. So the first one we're going to see, and this is going to kind of come out behind, for lack of a better term, or lateral to, so as major, is going to be 
aerial hypogastric. And what we're going to see is ileal hypogastric is going to, as you can see from the picture, it's going to kind of wrap around the ileum. The other nerve that we're going to see that's going to kind of do the same thing is going to be ileal inguinal. So it's going to kind of come around and wrap around too. The next one is actually going to pierce straight through the middle of psoas major. So we're going to draw this big circle here. And genitofemoral is going to pierce psoas major. Literally, you're going to see it, and you guys may have already seen it. In, have you guys eviscerated the cadavers yet? Okay, so you guys haven't seen it yet. You will. Oh, yeah? That's fun. That is interesting. Oh. The other one we're going to see is going to kind of shoot out lateral. And this one's really easy to identify because it literally stays lateral. This is going to be my lateral femoral cutaneous. We're going to have one that actually goes medial. I don't want that color. The one that's going to be medial to psoas major is going to be my obturator, which kind of makes some sense, right? So if my obturator nerve is going to innervate and have a destination point on my medial thigh, it's going to go basically down the course of least resistance or for the shortest distance from point A to point B, and it's going to stay medial to my psoas major. So when you're when you guys get to that point in cadaver lab, make sure you're taking a look at this stuff, right? So be able to identify each of those nerves based on their position in reference to psoas major. And then the only other one that we have is going to be the femoral nerve. And the femoral nerve, to be quite honest with you, is really super easy to identify because it's going to kind of come out, for lack of a better term, kind of the bottom, it kind of comes out lateral. And then once it passes the inguinal canal, okay, so let's say this dotted line here is my inguinal canal. And what we're going to see is the inguinal canal is going to be a huge line of demarcation for changing names of structures. Once it travels distal to the inguinal canal, the femoral nerve is going to shoot off all these little branches, which makes a lot of sense because think about how big my quadricep muscle is and think about where my quadricep muscle is in relation to my lumbar spine and the rest of these structures. So it needs to shoot out a lot of branches. So I'm going to see all these little branches coming off. And me, that's how I personally identify the femoral nerve. The one that has all these branches that come out just distal to the inguinal canal, that's going to be my femoral nerve. Okay? All right. Any questions on that? Everybody good? Everybody go with the drawing. Okay. All right. We're only going to cover one more thing. And one more thing is going to be 
just kind of a precursor to the blood supply of the viscera. And the way we're going to do that, we're just going to draw it in in relation to the aorta and the lumbar spine. Okay, so what I'm going to have here, we'll draw it in red because it's going to be a big artery. So this is going to be my aorta. And what we're going to see coming off the aorta, and again, this is going to supply the blood to my viscera and my gut is we're going to see three different unpaired arteries. Okay, so there's not a right and there's not a left here. These are unpaired arteries. And the way I'm going to draw them because they literally, and you'll see this in Canaveral Lab when we get to this point, they shoot right out the front. So the first one I'm going to see is going to happen and I'm going to say about because it's a little different in everybody, but it's going to be right about T12. And this guy here is called my celiac trunk. We're going to see a lot of patterns here. Okay, we're going to see a ton of patterns. My celiac trunk is going to supply all of the blood to my four gut structures. Okay, so we're going to write in four gut. Now, what in the world is a four gut? Right, we haven't talked about one, two, or three guts yet. Right now, we're already talking about four guts. My four gut structures are going to be my liver, my spleen, a little bit. So basically, I'm going to write in half of the pancreas because the pancreas is a it's an odd little duck. We're, when we when we cover the pancreas, we're going to see that blood supply comes from you name it. It gets blood from everywhere. My gallbladder. And my stomach. Those are my four gut structures. What we're going to see, just like we've seen with a lot of other neurovascular bundles and neurovascular patterns, my celiac trunk is going to supply the blood to my four gut structures. My celiac plexus, because there is a celiac plexus, is going to supply the sympathetic innervation to my four gut structures. And we're going to get into that next week when we talk about the sympathetic innervation to the viscera. So when I see celiac, I'm thinking four gut. When I'm thinking foregut, liver, spleen, half of the pancreas, gallbladder, stomach. Okay. The next little cat we're going to see here is going to come off right about L1. So this is going to be L1. And this is going to be called my superior. mesenteric artery. Now what we're going to see is that in my abdomen, I'm going to have what are called mesenteries.
So, okay, who's been to a professional baseball game? Who has sat up in the mezzanine? Everyone sat in the mezzanine? I, I, I grew up pretty humbly, so we always sat in the mezzanine. Dr. Justice, you sat in the mezzanine? Where's the mezzanine located in the baseball stadium? Up and out. It's this big, you ever seen like the big, you're kind of worried that it's going to fall? That big area that kind of comes out over the seats? And it looks like it's kind of suspended by next to nothing? That's what a mezzanine is. It's basically seats that come out from the structure that are suspended. Mesentery means suspension structure. So what we're going to see, and you guys will actually see this cadaver lab, you guys are going to take out the viscera and you're going to say, holy cow, what's holding this stuff back? And you're going to see all of these pieces of connective tissue that literally hold the vast majority of my organs, the vast majority of my visceral organs in suspension. So all the superior mesenteric artery really means is that it is the superior artery that provides blood to those organs or viscera in suspension. That's all it means. What my superior mesenteric artery is going to supply is going to be my mid gut structures. My mid gut structures are going to be my small intestines. And a half of the colon. And remember, my colon is just my large intestine. Okay. So moving more distally, I'm going to draw this one in not as these little circles because it has actually has a longer trunk to it. So it kind of comes out this little trunk here. It's pretty easily identified. And this is going to come out right about L3. This is going to be my inferior mesenteric artery. My inferior mesenteric artery is going to supply what we call the hindgut structures. Now, my hindgut structures are going to be things like the other half of the colon, my sigmoid colon, and the rectum. Now I'm going to put a little asterisk next to the rectum because the rectum literally gets arterial flow from all sorts of different spots. It's going to get arterial flow from inferior mesenteric artery. It's going to get flow from all sorts of different spots because what we're going to see is we're going to see we'll have middle rectal arteries and lateral rectal arteries and you name it. Trust me, the rectum gets plenty of blood. Okay? So that's in the gut, that's basically how the blood supply from the very beginning is going to work. All right? So celiac trunk, foregut, superior mesenteric artery, midgut, inferior mesentery, mesenteric artery, excuse me, hindgut. From here, what we're going to see is that my aorta is going to start splitting. And the first split I'm going to see my aorta is going to be called the common iliac artery. 
Now, as we have remembered from other blood supplies, when I see the word common, what's that going to mean? It's going to split into two, right? Trunk means it's going to split into a whole lot of branches. Hey, look at that. That should be a precursor for next week. When we draw that celiac trunk, I don't know, are those chairs equipped with seat belts? We're going to have to buckle up. It's going to be a fun one. I, I personally like it. Common iliac artery is going to split out into two different branches. It's going to split out into something called the internal iliac artery So way down here, I think they missed. <laughs> yep. So the internal iliac artery is going to be one of those branches. What we're going to see is the internal iliac artery is going to come down and it's going to supply a lot of those internal pelvic structures, right? And we'll draw out all the branches to the internal iliac artery when we cover the pelvis. That's another one. Better make sure there's a seat belt. Since we have an internal iliac artery, it's probably, this is just me, probably a good idea to have an external iliac artery as well. And what we're going to see is that the external iliac artery, as it travels distal to the inguinal canal, remember the inguinal canal, the inguinal ligament, to be more specific, is going to be one of those big lines of demarcation. So we talked about last semester, like Terry's Major. Remember how blood supply changed names when it hit Terry's Major? Same thing is going to happen here. After the external iliac artery passes under the inguinal ligament, it's going to change names to the femoral artery. Okay, so my external iliac artery it's going to travel And after it passes the inguinal ligament, it's then going to become the femoral artery. Okay? All right. <clears throat> I think that's enough for today, don't you guys? <laughs> All right. My, my suggestion is read up over the weekend. Make sure... You know viscera, make sure you know how the viscera is made, what it does, each of the organs. And then we're going to get into all the positions and blood supply and nerves next week. And then we move on to the pelvis. Yes. Yeah, stay on both sides. Yep. So, yeah, there is a right common iliac and there's a left common iliac. And there's going to be a right internal iliac and a right external iliac and left and left. All right.